All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here. It's Smirking Gun. And we have finally, it took us a while, but I've been savoring this. Um, but we're finally at the end of my discussions, my episode to episode discussions of Mike Flanagan's The Fall of the House of Usher. It's on Netflix. Um, and if you're liking what we're doing here still, after all this time, or if you're new to the channel and you're liking what we're doing now, uh, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, all that jazz. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all come down to this, you know, uh, this was the big, like how it all went down, how it's all going to finish up. And I, I noticed right off the top of the, uh, thing I want to mention is that this one wasn't directed by Mike Flanagan. Um, I don't think it really mattered that much, but, uh, it was, int this was making it all come together. Um, as good as it is, it, you have to be able to stick the landing. And I do think that because I was able to, like, you know, I was right. I mean, some of the stuff kind of could be seen coming a mile away as far as the, what did Roderick and Madeline do? I mean, we pretty much knew that they, you know, they killed, you know, they killed somebody at least one person and we knew that it would probably be rufus and if you figured out it was probably him buried in the foundation some of that stuff was pretty you know it was getting laid out pretty easily and so i think outside of that like the fact that i was able to and i think a lot of people could just tell um where it was where some of this was going it, it limited a little bit of my like what I felt in the other episodes, which was how, like, how, how is it going to happen? How are they going to die? How, like, why or whatever. And we've gotten all of that over all these other episodes. And so, um, finally coming together, it just kind of, um, you know, I get to say disappointing or anything like that. Cause it's, it's all really, really good. It's just the one that like, after all this time, I, there was not a lot of surprise there was there was like in in the like overall like yes they're all doomed so what's the point and again it's about the journey so the journey though in this episode and like how it lays out what happens to everybody else and everything um you know puts the you know final touches on certain things the one thing we i don't know if we they ever really talked about was how and like they allude to annabelle lee and maybe like again if i miss this somewhere in the series them saying how she is not there anymore i'm assuming she died because i mean roderick says she couldn't live without the children um so if i miss that somewhere like it, where she took her own life or something uh somebody put that in the comments or let me know the discord my little community will let me know um if I've missed this detail somewhere. Um, but this still was a really, really well acted, well executed episode. And um, yeah, let's just jump right into it. After we were jumping in, it's like four minutes in to the video. I want to thank anybody who's watched these. I want to thank everybody who will see these in the future and uh, hopefully it ages well. I was looking at some of my older stuff and went, <laughs> opinions change, people change. And since my channel is really kind of a, a blog for my life and how when I talk about movies and TV shows, it's like, I don't know, it's personal. So we get personal here and uh, it's how we talk about things. And uh, sometimes in the past, you know, it's like, you know, I, I kind of cringe a little bit when I realize, man, I have actually grown and changed as a person and I can see some of my, uh, you know, you can start to see if you're, you know, a little bit self-aware that, you know, things that you uh, wish you had been differently. And, you know, like when you're talking about a show like this, I think this kind of conversation fits because a lot of it is like, 
everything that you've done before, everything, all the choices that you've made, everything that's led up to this, all the justifications and everything else. And if you can look back at yourself and, and see the change that you've made and maybe, you know, having it, <laughs> having it on film, uh, maybe uh, that's a good thing, I think. You know, you'd be able to remind yourself where you came from and how you changed. I mean, I've even left up my last Jedi review from a million years ago because I want to be reminded of like how my opinion can change on something and that I'll stick with it. And if somebody watches it ever and calls me out and be like, hey, man, blah, blah, blah. I'll be like, yeah, you know, people change. Some people don't. Some people like that are in this show. Some people like Madeline and Roderick. And Arthur Pym and people who just that they are who they are now and they're not going to make any more apologies about it. And I kind of like that a little bit. Is the go down, <laughs> go down completely in denial. Roderick's not in denial, but he's a coward. He was a coward and it's like he's a self aware coward, but a coward nonetheless. Um, but you know, it, it just, it, a lot of this episode just, you know, puts a mirror up to us and the rot and the ushers, right. The ushers want to put, hold a mirror up to society and say that it's society's fault that they are the way they are. Um, and I think a big crux of a lot of this discussion is going to be, you know, about that outside of just talking and gushing about who did what in this episode and how great it was. But a lot of this is like the corporate, you know, corporate justifications and how people can just get away with things, you know, like, you know, they do kind of, there was a Trump joke in here and I'll just get it out of the way. Cause you know, I'm no fan of, of Trump, but it felt a little on the nose. Like if, if real deals with devils were being made to people like Trump, what would, you know, if this was all real, right heaven and hell and angels and gods and demons and shit is like for straight up folks. When we talk about this, you should already know that I'm an atheist. So, you know, I, I'm drawn to religious stuff because I grew up in a, in a very strict religious background. And so this kind of stuff just fascinates me about how we use these things to justify our bad behavior or lack thereof or our good behavior and everything else in between. But, uh, <laughs> I won't, I promise we won't be going too hard down like that road, but anyway, millions dead on Ligadone. That's how we start, right? So yeah, this is going to be like that kind of discussion of, we've talked about it before, legacy and what's important and money and all that. But we start right off the bat, like, you know, for the, the veil's dropped, right? I mean, like I said last episode, Vern is the devil. Like a devil we've never seen before. I love it. I love this performance. I love that this devil is, you know, like we don't we don't know the exact details of this devil's like job. Like where like who gave it to them? I mean, if there's a devil, then there's a god, right? You know. But the devil's and it in and in like very classic biblical, you know, kind of fashion, the devil is there to you know, tempt us to make us, you know, do bad things to other people to for our own gain if needed, you know, the have your fun now, pay for it later. It's <laughs> there are things in our world that are, are are exactly that. So, you know, the devil's in the is a lot more, you know, real in some fashion. It's just more of a concept. Uh, than an actual thing. We're 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 the devils. We create. It's like you know. We what is it? An Iron Man. I can't believe I'm doing Iron Man three like quote. But like, what's he say? We create our own demons, and it's true. I mean, it's true. It just happens to be from an Iron Man movie. <laughs> um, but it, it's still universal. I think. Um, and I again, this devil that's doesn't necessarily you know like it it, it 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 likes what it does when it's justified it does what it has to even if it doesn't like it 
if it's part of the deal, then it's part of the deal. And, you know, we, I, I, the question about what happened to Lenore and me thinking, well, maybe there is some way that, you know, maybe Madeline couldn't find a loophole, but maybe the devil could, but the devil doesn't. And I was as, as heartbreaking as it was again, it's like when you watch midnight mass or other things where it's just like this heartbreak, this absolute heartbreaking thing that happens and it's still like it's the right thing. So it's, you know, you you deal with it and, you, and it makes it even more good because it didn't pull its punches. And it wasn't afraid to go there and just, I mean, look, at least the, at least Lenore got to go out unlike the way all the other ones did. But that that speech that the devil gives Lenore, <laughs> it's like... Here, have a seat. But before we get to all of that, because it's hard not to just want to have all the things just kind of pour out of your mouth all at once and in no discernible order. When it's like a ton of information is like, you know, you know, just I just finished watching it. So the devil's there with Roderick in the basement where, yeah, you know, Behind that wall is Rufus, and it, it, I mean it was clear. I, I, I it, it was, it was, in, it was interesting how you know, yep, he was the guy in the jester costume. That was another thing that I saw like after a while. I mean, I think I should be happy that like the show laid out a bunch of clues and I put them together, and they we were right. And uh, so I should be happy instead of like going, oh, well, I figured it out. But the show is asking me to put it together if I wanted to, and I did. So I can't get mad that I figured it out, all these little details. Again, they weren't that hard to figure out either. Um, but the whole her just sitting there, look, Roderick, this is how it is. <laughs> like, I can't accept your resignation. You guys know how this works, you know. You can deny it all you want, but here's the proof. Everybody's dead. And I think uh, in the story, when they talk about how after it all happened, they, they it felt like a dream or whatever, and that they just kind of forgot about it. I mean, if, if there was a line that the devil said where it's like, you know, well, people tend to kind of forget after the deal's made uh, because otherwise, you know, I don't know. I, I, if they had thrown it, because if I went into a bar that didn't exist and talked to a woman that even said to me that we are working outside of time and space, um, and I left and then that bar was no longer there, and yeah, maybe I do have to worry about the guy I buried in the basement. But I would still be thinking about the deal with the devil that I just made. I don't think I'd forget, but it's for the story. And. I mean, look, I, I would have liked it if they had kept that, like, maybe that they were just, like, in denial. Like, just heavy, heavy denial, I guess. But I, I don't know. They were. He was, anyway. She wasn't. But he was always in denial. <laughs> and Madeline was always, like, you know, eyes wide open. She knows who she is. And Roderick was always fighting that, I think. He would just still do it. He would still go down that road, but he would, like hem and haw and you know clutches pearls and and yet still would go down the wrong path because he's a coward um you know madeline i mean she tries to loophole the devil i mean she's one of the best characters <laughs> everybody in this is like roderick's a really good character too but like and like i said his acting is fantastic and so is madeline's but like it's like i feel like roderick's acting no, they're both really good. I think that she just didn't get quite enough as much time to show us just how like like rotten she was. Like I still want more. So uh Mary McDonald again, just fantastic as this just un like she sees this man's world and she is pissed about it and she has let like all of that just well it's more than that but like she's let that just poison her 
the jester jump scare uh, was like, I don't know, because again, you, we knew this was where we know it's coming and this is where it's less of least effective as far as like, you know, we know it's not real. Like the first time we saw the jester in the very first episode, that worked. That worked because I didn't expect that and I didn't know what the context was. I don't know who that was. How were they going to work that in? But then when, when you saw it again, it just felt more like something out of The Conjuring. I mean, it was still cool. The Jester costume is fucking terrifying. There's a goddamn horror movie spinoff right there. Um, and we jump right into Arthur Pym, who, again, gets a great closeout to his story, too. And a great moment. I was wondering, like... Arthur's got to meet the devil, right? We got to, and, and that moment was just as telling and just as like, when you talk about people who are, who've made bad choices and, and how they deal with it, you know, you've got the ushers who make their choice like rather easily, kind of glibly, like kind of just like, you know, like the, is this real? What if it is real? We're taking the deal. Like, anyway, um, He's there trying to get Lenore to lie for the family. And it's just, he, you know, it's, she's finally done. She's over it. Her father tortured her mother. And he's still going, you got to care about the company. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, like your story. Yeah. Okay, fine. But you got to go back there and tell them blah, blah, blah. And she's just like, I, you know, we're again, it's, we've already had seven episodes of the bullshit. Now the bullshit's ending. And I think it's when I say that, like, oh, this was a little bit lesser. It's like, no, this is like the goods finally going, starting to, you know, justice is finally starting to happen. The, the, the evil is starting to be removed. And I think people just find it more interesting to watch the suffering than the, the part where the comeuppance happens like where, where, where it should happen. And it's like, when it's like positivity is less interesting than negativity. And we all know it. Want to know why I know it? Let's look at YouTube's algorithm. Look at all the people who make positive content. They get hardly any views at all. So this, you know, that's, I think in my own head, I had to like go, no, this is the good thing. <laughs> like you should be happy or that happier that this is all happening and coming down and, and being handled right this is what's supposed to happen this is how people are supposed to act when somebody tells you to lie to help the company out most people probably are going to be like the ushers I can't even say that within 100% certainty that I would be as good as like Lenore needs to be. Those are the things that what happens in the moment. You know what I mean? We won't, you don't know until you're there, but there are moments in all our lives where we're there. And whatever reasons we have to make the wrong decisions, we still make them. And, um, uh, I like that she's, you know, he, she just won't, she doesn't budge on him. She's the crack in the, the first, like, real crack in all of this, the first sign of, like, everything's really coming down. Like, the rest of the world, you know, they just read about these kind of cases in the news, but they're not there to see all the other things that happen. And, um, yeah, it's, it was, it's nice to see, like, Lenore, you know, try before she dies to, to do something. Um, and now Roderick, you know, they immediately, you know, they tell him, you know, like, Hey, she's not playing ball. And he just, you know, he's still saying the same thing. Like she's the best of us, blah, blah, blah. But they, he also brings up the, Oh yeah, you guys tried to hit, you know, like the board's going to push me out. Madeline's coming in all of a sudden. I'm dead. You get me to kill myself before you guys can just straight up kill me. And she's like, well, no, come on. This is math and mercy. 
like she breaks it she breaks it like again she breaks it down in just such like cold calculated numbers and just a way of thinking about like what's best you're dying you're seeing things everybody's dying i believe you're meant to die i think that i can get myself out of this if i kill you i i i i i i i uh, it, nothing about it was about him she pretends that she can't like because look at how they uh, each and every one of these people handled the deaths of people really outside of roderick just going, oh my God, it's all really happening. What? But I, I'm still going down that road. I still going out and buying stupid shit. And I'm still treating Juno like she's a trophy. And I'm still like, you know, it's just. He's, you know, it's like he's sitting there yelling at each other for being who they are. Of course, they were going to turn on her on you. You probably would have turned on them. The whole thing is just this terrible, you know, nest of vipers and cysts that think they're, you know, I've said this before, <laughs> they just justify everything. Um, but I loved Math and Mercy. Basically, they're just, again, it's her justifying, well, you know, we have to keep the business and you're sick and la la la. And here's where we get we, you know, when we were told about Annabelle and how she had custody of the kids, and then you know, because he, he sees her, he says that he saw her at the funeral, and he turns around and he has this conversation with her spirit, which I'm just assuming it's the devil, just taking Annabelle's face and talking about like the downfall of these kids of, of Freddie and Tamerlane that when she left him for what he became and we might as well throw that in here too is you know like her confronting Roderick over betraying August betraying everything like showing his real true colors showing it like how much of like even their own, like their relationship, how much is that real? Is is Annabelle Lee just this the person, the thing that he's supposed to have, like the cover, the regular normal father? Meanwhile, I'm, you know, secretly plotting with my sister to to take over my my father's company, but I need to have like the presentation of like normalcy and average man kind of ness going on. And then now that that veneer has been dropped and he can't quite believe that she doesn't understand it or but you know like like it's like the fantasy he's still he's in denial and the fantasy finally drops for her and she sees him for what he is and i mean she just is like i i have to leave you i can't be around this the kids can't be around this and so when they talk about that she had custody and that that burned him up you know he took something for me knowing that she's right, but still not being able to accept that, you know. And they hadn't even gotten to the deal part, so he's already at a weakened state in his mental, you know, mentally because of what he'd done there. But that you flashed him the money, you showed kids, you know, a bunch of money. And of course they chose him. Kids are like that. I When I had a choice back when my parents were getting divorced, it, it really didn't feel like it. Well, there was a moment where there was a choice, though, secondary. Where after, like, my, my mother left us, there was no choice to like go with her. She was leaving no matter what. She abandoned us. But I, me and my just younger sister, we went to live with my mother's parents and my just younger, my youngest sister, who's uh, got a different dad than me and my other sister. 
she stayed with her dad and we went off with my mom's parents. But after a year, there was a time where everybody kind of came together and was like, is this working? Should we, you know, we go back? And there had already been this like private meeting that we, me and my sister were just going to stay. And this, you know, this meeting was just to tell my little sister that we weren't coming back with them. And, um, in a kid's head, and the reason I'm telling you this is just like the mental state of a kid, like what you do when somebody presents you with a choice. And it's the choice that you think you'd make when you're, a, you know, the, the you'd make in a, as a kid is not necessarily one that you would have made as an adult or if you were more informed about things. If you weren't like always just thinking about your base or instincts about, you know, not just, uh, you know, like having a roof over your head, but like who gives me the best stuff? Who treats, you know, where, where's the best opportunity? And even though in my situation that they, the choices were bad and worse, <laughs> I chose bad over worse or what I thought was. And it was, I don't, you know, I don't know what would have happened. It, it was, it was bad and worse. <laughs> it was like good and medium. It wasn't like good or bad, but I still picked it from a selfisher standpoint because I was choosing to not be around my little sister. I was like 12 years old. So, I mean, I, I have to let some of that, like, you know, forgive myself for that, you know, but when you see like them talking about this and like they own kids only know, like basically what they're saying is, the kids only know appetite and that you just like, and that's true. We are like, kids are just like about the next thing. It's just like more, 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 more. Because there's, we're, you know, they're sponges. We're, we're sponges. We're still like, if you're, if you're really into it, you know, like you're always still learning and, you know, taking things in. But as a kid, it's just like nonstop. You can take it all and more. And if it's money, well, again, you know, I could sit here. I can't sit here in judgment just because I didn't have like money, but I do know like how we all operate. Right. And so with that much money, who's, who's to say, you know, like it's, if you see it taint just about anybody it comes into contact with. And, and as if, the younger it is, the worse it is. We've all seen children of of wealth become not great people. I'm not saying that there aren't some out there that aren't all right. I, you know, again, I shouldn't condemn them all, but the general consensus that what we've seen, what we've, what the evidence that we have as as society says that it taints everybody. Yeah, we all want to be there because we all know that being there, though, as bad as you will be, as bad as you tend to be, as much as people look down at the rest of the, the society like ants, people would still rather be up there looking down than down looking up. And it's and it doesn't seem to matter what it makes you. And that's kind of, again, in the end, with the part of what this episode is, the show is doing is holding a mirror up to our like what we are willing to do to each other is to have a little power and money that in the end, like where we could be do spending so much more of our time helping each other as a, as a communal, as a society to fix the ills of the world, we still decide to be islands into ourselves and only take care of either just ourselves or that little group of people that are surround us that insulate us that we all in you know that you know like little tribes again very tribal you know and even then if that starts to break apart everybody turns on each other it's still about the single individual instead of the group and it just shows that like that's what happens and these kids were empty siphoned of anything good. And also, you know, this episode has a, the great use of finally using the actual, like, the Raven 
story, the actual quoted Raven. A lot of, you know, there's plenty of like lines from Shakespeare and other stuff strewn throughout this series. But this one, just like in the classic Simpsons Halloween of Horror with Homer Simpson, recite, uh, Dream, James Earl Jones uh, reciting the Raven, we finally get like the majority of that in this spoken or narrated throughout i love that it's the it's it's so again there it's all coming to together and the raven is his most famous work so of course you leave it for the end and we have that whole him kind of quickly reliving everything that led to him collapsing saying it's time and they have the, the the cognac and he's like you sure i can't tempt you and he's like yeah i wish i had said that because he says no and we get the whole rufus is the jester he becomes like roderick immediately is like the the superstar fortunato this guy knows who roderick is this guy knows he's like he's ba you know like the bastard son of the, the company owner and he shouldn't trust this guy and all this but he's and i still don't think i still think that what rufus is doing is still bluster keep your enemies close he wants roderick as his right hand man because he knows that if something's gonna happen it's gonna come from this guy that he's praising right he's sitting there praising this guy right you you did it you did all this and that and the other and you're gonna never want for this or that and the other but at the same time, you know that he's like, can't believe you did this. But he's now like, I can't let this guy out of my fucking sight. Which is the only way that they had to get him was, well, how do you get him out? Like how you would be the obvious choice, you know? So all Broderick, though, had to do was leave the room and leave him with his sister for just literally, what, less than 10 seconds before she already had him wrapped around her finger little tongue action to the guy's ear or whatever <laughs> and he's just you know she knows how to work men she come you know she says a lot about it i mean this men this whole society is still driven by men's desire and she's right it is all about fucking for most of it, <laughs> it really is. it just comes down to that they they want to they want to fuck when they when they she says when they're immortal and when they want to die and everywhere in between Wow, they just ripped the rights away from women and everybody else. And not just, you know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, just to just suddenly drop that. But yeah, he's he's not gonna want like and he's not gonna like they just get to him before he gets to them. He might not have done what they did though. Not until they like did something and maybe they got caught, but they weren't going to wait to get caught. So they just fucking bury him in the foundation. Like, you know, it's pretty clear they were going to do that. Uh, I mean, I've seen that before. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen a uh, show called Angel. There's an episode where a guy is buried alive and the, they show it like the guy getting buried. Like, what are you doing? Um, and, you know, he goes through the stages and she puts the brick in front of him to see he puts the mask on him you know and the brick that says you are small you are so small and that's exactly what annabelle lee said to madeline is you are so small and she's just throwing it like just two small people they are exactly the same rufus and willa willa's madeline i can't <laughs> sorry uh i got the actors in the character confused for a second but Madeline and him are basically the same. And she's just throwing that in his face because she knows, she knows who she is. She knows she's small, but she doesn't care because she wants to win. And that's the scary thing is those people, like what really scares me are the true believers, the people that really know, like, and still do it anyway, because that's how bad they want it is just they they will get to you before you get to them and it's it's a matter of like time 
she's just so there's just a lot of people i i've just seen so many people like that these days especially again on this platform when you make stuff when you run in certain circles when you <coughs> and all you ever see are people like this they're not all it's not everybody but the ones that are they stand out and they don't need to show us and they don't bother like showing up like how they found the bar or whatever they just go they just it's just there because it exists it's been a trap it's the honeypot and so they just go right in like she finds them like the devil just finds them and i don't know they're just two kids practically just you know whatever but their desire their avarice their and their reasons for doing it are just so I mean, they're perfect. She, I mean, she's like, you're killers. You guys are killers. You killed somebody tonight. I mean, she lets the veil drop, which leads them to believe like, okay, this might be real because she just knows everything. We just did it. There's no way she could know. But the deal is that you'll get everything you want. I can guarantee that nothing will come of this. You're going to get away with killing this guy. And you're going to get away with everything. Nothing will ever stick to you. That's where the Trump joke comes in, where she's like talking about the whole, I told one of my clients, you know, I, I, I really wish that line wasn't in here. I really do. I felt like as much as it's, again, it's all true. Like it's a cheap shot. I, I, when I say cheap shot, it's, I shouldn't even say cheap shot. It's again, I don't like the idea of, that, you know, like that being the, you know, like, well, that's why Donald Trump doesn't, you know, like, I know that this show isn't literally saying that that's what happened. It's just, it doesn't sit well with me because <laughs> it basically means they're, and it's telling us, and maybe that's why I don't like it, is the reality is there's no justice for these kind of people. It's like they've made deals with the devil, but the deals are that they just, everybody's the devil. <laughs> they're all, none of them will, none of them will let any of them go down unless, they all come tumbling down and the whole thing falls apart once they all start ratting on each other. It's, I mean, we need that to happen. We need that to happen for the sake of ourselves, but it's never going to, it's never really going to happen that we don't live in that kind of world. Um, but the whole deal is that when just as he's about to die in the time, in the plan that he would die in like the timeline, uh, just before he dies, all of his bloodline will die too. Now, the order, <laughs> the order didn't, you know, seemed to be specific, but since Lenore was last before Roderick and Madeline, I mean, I think they just that was more for dramatic effect. Um, because man, I would have just, <laughs> Lenore should have been the first one to go. <laughs> Like just in her sleep, just go. But her arc otherwise wouldn't have been as good. Um, but they die together again. Madeline always trying to like find a way out, even in the deal, right? She's always trying to find a way so that she could step to the side and do her own thing if needed to just kind of sidestep everything. Oh, I want this, but I'm gonna try to click. She's always looking for cover. She's always looking for that out, and there's no out. Temporary happiness, struggle, or ease of life. I mean, this is where, you know, like, it's almost like she, like, the de again, this devil is interesting because in another circumstance, she might say, look, this is your chance to, like, stop. But it's like she sees the bad in them and she wants them to like feel the fall. But in order to feel that fall, a whole bunch of other people would die. So it's just, it's still a very interesting. So she offers them the con the cognac, the same that he's drinking at the and during the whole show, you know, that you drink this on your best day or your last day. Um, 
and that Roderick again he throws this off as folly ado, a mad with sh a madness shared by two, um, which was also a really good X file. <laughs> well, wait, you know, uh, I liked the premise of folly ado as an X file, but I, I I don't know if it was one of my. It's definitely not one of my favorites, um, but I still like it. The blind spot, the blind spot episode, everybody. Um, and not the one with all the tattoos, a literal blind spot. Uh, we find out that Pim does have a weakness. It's asthma. You know, like I kind of like that the guy was just basically, you know, a, a complete tough guy, but then he's got this asthma probably that he got from his, like, <laughs> I don't know if you can, I don't know how asthma works. If it's just something genetic or if it's something you get, I don't know. I, again, my own ignorance. Somebody tell me how you get asthma. If it's, whatever but he's got it i would have said he got it somewhere if he can catch it like during his like whole ordeal and that's like the the thing that reminds him all the time of what happened is always having to take that inhaler and every time he goes to get his breath back you know it's like everything flashes before his eyes because we find out that he had a very interesting life and saw a bunch of things on this journey and there was the whole, they left somebody in the desert and this thing with the Inuit woman and, you know, you didn't, you didn't partake, but, you know, also I liked it. Like she lets him, she just kind of lets him like think that he killed her and that she was going to get chopped up or whatever. And I was like, I mean, I'm sitting there going, no, like, no. Like she's not actually a person. And so it was it was good that I love that she's just like, I couldn't help it. I said fuck it. Like I wanted to actually get like what would it be like? What does it what is it like like to experience the Arthur Pym disappearing uh, you know, act, which is, you know, drug somebody, wrap them up in plastic, cut off their heads and hand, throw them, take them, put them in a barrel, take them a hundred miles offshore, dump the body. That's a lot of work, but that's how you do it. If you if you want to know if you have the if you, if you have to absolutely get rid of somebody and money is not an object and you absolutely don't want to get caught. I mean, there's little details along the way that can get anybody caught, but that's a pretty effective one. But that's a very expensive one. That would be expensive to be like you know. It's like if Dexter was like went went pro, you know, like went full on like hired assassin or something. Then you know, like like if he was if Dexter went corporate and he's just like. Everywhere around the world, I have people killing for me, and this is how we get rid of it. We chop them up in plastic, we put them in a barrel, we take, you know. <laughs> but uh, I love that she lets him just have that moment just so she can experience the Pym way. Um, and she, uh, you know, she she gives him, like, the deal. Like, she's like, look, you can, you can also... Just be, you know, you can be fine too. You'll, there's paperwork that'll put you away. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we'll make that go away. She also says, right, she talks about all the money like that he could have, like all the money that people have, right? All the billionaires and just all the people with all the money, the 1% of this, at least, you know, in, in this country. But if you counted all the world, all the people with all the money and and it, it gets brought up all the time and i'm sure that many of us have this thought anytime we have to hear about somebody that's like super super wealthy and they're like so and so just bought a brand new mansion in malibu or some crap you know they bought a private fucking island or we hear about the fucking bunkers that people like zuckerberg are making and you and you know that everything they've accrued Everything that they've done and made or, or, or for whatever reasons that they have, they could solve the world's problems with their money and have more to spare because there's always money being made. People are always consuming. That's what there's this another thing that this episode, you know, it talks about is us just consuming, blaming us for wanting it, giving it to us and not saying no because fuck us, right? There's such a, a, a lack of like, like any kind of like civic 
ethical ways to think about anything in this world. Again, it's still me, 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 I, I, I. And it again makes me wonder, do people really believe in anything? Do people really believe in anything? Or, or is the majority of people just using that as a denial, as a coping mechanism that, oh, you know, in the end, there's still that reward of heaven or hell that keeps me from doing things. Well, look at what, how those people operate. You think they're, you think they, they're worried about heaven or hell? They're not. And even if they are, they're just like, who gives a shit? In for a penny, in for a pound. Buy a ticket, take the ride. But they never do. Nobody, nobody will ever stand up and, and help out society for the greater good. And that might be a cynical thing to say, but the proof is in the motherfucking pudding, man. Look at the world. And I'm not saying, because then the argument would be right. Well, why don't you just do so? Like, why should we? It, why should we? If the argument is why should we? And we might as well just give up. Like you, that person, the world's clearly given up. That we would rather watch the whole thing burn than help each other out. We're a virus, as he says. And that corporate justice is a punchline. That you'll get, like her deal is like, look, man, this is going to be a slap on the wrist with a blow job. And again, I put Carla on the thumbnail finally because it, it needed to happen. I know I've talked about how beautiful she is, and she is. Um, but I, again, the reason I bring that up, and I feel bad always talking about it, because the first thing you notice is how just drop-dead gorgeous she is. And that is can be such a hindrance. You know, we always talk about how beauty is just so important. But, you know, the people who have it, like, say, in her profession – Look at how people with beauty are, are handled, especially women. Think about how many of them are just pigeonholed into having to be the sex symbol. Pop out your tits. And how, you know, they have to, they end up having to lean into that, even if they're really good actors. So many of them are really good actors and they don't even get a chance because they just are told, well, you know, this is what we want. This is what sells. So when, again, when you get to see her in these performances where they let her just be a person, let her be a character rather than, you know, look at my, look at my physique. I just, uh, anyway, it's just another thing that's wrong with the world, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, this is where we finally get a mention of Camille, which again, you know, if this show was a, a little bit longer, she, we knew that she we know that she found a bunch of stuff that would get put him away for like twenty years at least. But she, when she tries to say like, "What's the thing you love?" and you know where she's going with this, like you can get off, but that thing you love, well, uh, that thing is going to be used against you. And he's like, "I don't have any collateral." Like, what's your collateral? He's like, "I don't have any." And I keep waiting for, I was waiting for her to say, well, you forgot about this, but he doesn't. He's that rare person who, and maybe not so rare, I don't know, but he has no collateral because he has nothing he cares, he has nobody he cares about. And the reason he has nobody he cares about is so that no one can leverage him. Anybody who comes at him with anything, he there's nothing to pressure him with. He's done that to himself on purpose. He's chosen to punish himself like this. For who knows what reason, whatever was done to him, whatever he saw, whatever he felt, whatever he's experienced, has made him into this person that it will never let anyone get over on him. And I think that that's a person that even I would be have been tempted to be like. I've I know that like in my professional life, I really don't like feeling like someone can have leverage over me. And I, and it, it's a real, like, I, I actually could really relate to that part of it, but he's the one who, as bad as he is, right. He's, he's made, he's become a bad person, whoever he started out as and where he is now, he, his choices have 
made it that he's a bad guy. He is a bad person. And but he still won't take that way out. He would still rather play his hand. And somehow this guy with like who actually gets involved in death actually pulls you know like like he put her in that thing so he's a killer and even he wouldn't accept the deal from the devil he still would rather go out like and as say what you will you know but it's sad that it all it's still like this tragic dark thing that this man became just so that he would never have to be in this position, even from the fucking devil. Mark Hamill sat face to face with the devil and said, no. <laughs> He's saying no to the dark side one last time. Luke's redemption. <laughs> and Lenore confronts her grandfather, you know. And he's still, you know, she's like, look, man, you, this is a bad place. This, we did bad stuff. And he's like, I know, I know, but it was mine. And she tries to tell him, you know, just let it go. Let it all go. Like, we can still fix this. You can still, you know, be better. And so, like, you know, after this moment, right, he's, she goes into her room and there's Lenore or there's Verna. There's the devil sitting on the end of her bed. And I went, oh. And she's like, you know, this is the part of my job I hate. And you're just like, oh, God, no. And still sitting there, I want you to know. I want you to really know this. Your mother is going to, you know, like after, you know, like and she doesn't say you're going to die, but she's like, you know. Your mother's going to be okay. She goes through all of this. She gets a bunch of money. She becomes this. She starts the Lenore Foundation. She saves millions of lives, literally. And that you did that. You saved these people. And she just does the <laughs> literally. <laughs> I'm going to call it the John Travolta face-off thing. It's the family face-off where they put the hand on the face, you know. And she just dies. Just turns the light off. But that's not the end. And that's the worst part. <laughs> Is that Lenore went out peaceful. But Madeline used Lenore as a beta test for her AI upload. And now she's stuck on the internet. Her consciousness... I, well, a, a copy of her consciousness, I guess. Because let's, the, 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 the details on this, I don't want to misspeak on the technology that, <laughs> that doesn't, what, with that I don't know exists for sure. <laughs> I'll say it like that. Because um, who fucking knows, folks? Um, but she used Lenora, now she's stuck on the internet, texting nevermore till the end of time. Now, Roderick, and I just realized how long I'm talking, but oh well, it's the last one. The bodies that rain down to show his impact on the world. He's at the top of his tower talking to his dead zombie family. The rain coming down, and it's just bodies and bodies and bodies. Just fucking fantastic. Yes, it's CGI, but I don't care. And Maddie... You know, they finally go back to the house. Madeline comes down there. And she's still like, she's, you know, she, this is the time to accept it. He's accepting what's going to happen. And he's there to make sure that Madeline does too. Like, this is it. And she's, and she's still sitting there like she can still deal. She's always going to try to deal. And not really lose her shit about it either. She's so calm. Still justifying. Blaming society. If you don't want it, don't buy it. Don't fill your shit with poison if you don't want to be poisoned. We're going to make it, but you, you know, like saying that if people were eating kale salads, then that's what we'd make. 
but like these but they, these stewards of society right these people who just like make what well we're just giving them what they want well maybe if you're in a position like that maybe you should you know like and then it's just about societal ethical things and like why should anyone help anybody and blah 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 and it's still like just that thought of just me first me first Working in customer service my whole life, I can tell you right now that the person, two customers can be standing next to each other and have the most brilliant conversation of all time. It could be, you know, like dinner with Andre or some crap in the, in the, the, the fast food aisle, right? And, you know, like the frozen aisle, whatever. And they could be like, oh, you know, just getting to the bottom of fucking society's ills together. And then all of a sudden they could get a text that says toilet paper shortage. And if they be, you know, stay, <laughs> I should move this from the frozen fruit aisle to the paper aisle. <laughs> but those two people, if there's like only one roll of toilet paper on that shelf right then, that conversation will fucking end and they will rip each other's hair out to get that last roll of toilet paper. But in order, instead of like, helping this is how they choose to go about things and she even talks about it like roderick's own kids and how it was presented gorging themselves consuming that's all it is what do we teach them we teach them to consume and do what we do which also goes to like make me say like if people care so much about their children's future why do we keep dooming them to repeat everything that we've done why are we are, are people that in deep down, like when they say, oh, I just want a better life for my kids. I want them to have it better than I did. Well, then how come we keep making it worse? How come we keep making them exactly like us? How come we keep making them putting the same shit in their heads that is in ours? If we really want them to live better, we would fucking figure out our own shit and let them live their lives and change the world for actual they could actually change the world instead of just carrying more of our baggage that we put on them. Just coming from someone with no kids, but I see a lot. But Roderick uh, doesn't let the devil get Maddie. No, he takes her out himself. Well, he poisons her, right? <laughs> And she, he thinks she's dead, but again, full circle. Cause he, I mean, like she was called Cleopatra, right? By Berna. So just like Cleopatra, he tries to fucking mummy her. He has all that shit from Egypt too, that he keeps getting right. All this thing about the afterlife and the tomb and buried alive. And it all comes full circle because he buries her in. She, he calls the child at home, this, their tomb. He buries her alive, just like her mother was buried alive. They didn't know. And he's like, I knew I would climb to the top on a pile of corpses. That you can't eliminate pain. You know? <laughs> he just, just all this awfulness is coming out. And she comes back. Busting out of that room, poor August is like, never going to forget this shit. And see, he's not going to be the kind of person who sees something and then like after a little while, just kind of you know, like, oh, was, did that really happen? But she comes out because just like their mother, she wasn't dead. You didn't finish the fucking job. And just like her mother, she chokes out the head of Fortunato screaming. It was, it was so awesome. It was so terrifyingly awesome. Just her ah! over him as she chokes and his look on his face as he dies. And the house comes tumbling down. And again, almost like like in that Simpsons Halloween, like the first Halloween of horror where they go into the, like the haunted house and it like implodes in on itself. It doesn't implode, but it does more like kind of like pork, you know, just, like, just collapses it down around itself. Just <sighs> till there's nothing left and. I did like, did you guys, did anybody else notice that it looked like August, like that Carl Lumbly like slid toward the door when he left? Kind of did a little move. I don't know. It felt like he did a little move, but he gets out and they're on top of all of it after they've clearly been crushed. 
there's Verna with the glowing red eyes on the top of everything, looking down like a nightmare. Oh, that turns into the Raven, flies past August. And we get our little epilogue that Juno was a sole beneficiary. So his like tro his wife of the face of Legadon got everything, shuts it all down. Arthur gets arrested. And August goes to tell us all this to the tombstones amongst all the Usher family. And he takes the recorder and he leaves it at the gravesite. And he's just basically like, you know, I, there's no reason for any of this. And I'm not going to leave this. I'm going to, I'm not going to let you, this out. Like it doesn't matter in the end. And that, you know, you had everything, but you had nothing and you lost it all. And you could have had everything. You could have had the, you could have changed the world for the better and, Instead, you and everyone around you died. And that I'm, the, and it, it might be cornball, but he's like, you know, I'm going home to my husband and kids, and I'm the richest man in the world. And the raven flies past, lands on this tombstone, puts the trophies on from all the kids and all the things that their little symbolism. And that raven is sitting there at the top of that tombstone forevermore. And that's the end. And what a fantastic, fantastic, like, it's, if, if I watched it all as a movie, like one great big long ass movie, just really, really excellent. Mike Flanagan, my tip of the hat to you, the slow clap everything the cheers the accolades everything you always deserve when you make one of these things i am currently finally finishing the midnight club which is again i don't know why i sat on it i never sit on his stuff but i i think it had because it was dealing with younger people but it's also fantastic and filled with great dialogue and great acting from younger actors it's a interesting concept based on the works of christopher pike if you have not seen it uh it it weaves together a really interesting story about cancer and survival and stories within stories like the stories that you tell yourself to scare you because if you've got a death sentence what can scare you any more than that um and i recommend checking out all of his stuff from oculus to the ouija movie that actually was all right to dr sleep to all the haunting shows, Midnight Mass. If you have not seen Midnight Mass, you need to watch it now. And of course, this show. And I want to thank everybody who has watched these, will watch these, blah, blah, blah. I hope I did a good enough job for you. I hope I made it interesting. And I hope you guys, you know, can think of, you know, that's what we're doing here is I think and I talk about how I feel and what it reminds me of in my life and society and everything and how. That's how we watch things. If you listen to how people talk about things, they may just be, you know, some people just go out and give a standard review. But I talk about how we sit and feel about things. How that's what we do when we watch things. They remind us of things. They make us feel things. They bring up things. Just most people don't talk about all that when they talk about any of this stuff. They either complain or they're praising. And I think the devil's in the details. <laughs> so anyway thanks for watching everybody this is rob at smirking gun don't forget to hit like and subscribe and we will see you well if you only watch my mike flanagan stuff we'll see you on the next mike flanagan thing i'll probably be making one big review for midnight club when i'm done i should be doing episode to episode but i don't have the time so anyway have a great day and i'll see you on the next video